Please welcome the host of the Jason Rand Show from 3 to 6 p.m. on AM 770 KTTH. Your moderator, Jason Rantz. Hello. Thank you guys so much. Wow. Thank you. Let's do that again. That kind of made me feel good. Thank you guys so much for uh, coming out, braving the traffic, the coronavirus for coming out here tonight. It's the first time we've ever done something like this. This is our first gubernatorial debate. And let me set up the ground rules first, and then we're going to bring them all out. This is supposed to be like a radio show. So this is not going to be, I'm going to ask one question of each person, and they get 60 seconds to speak. We're not going to do that. We're actually going to have an interaction up here like a radio interview, which, as it turns out, we're airing this on the radio. So no cussing out there, please. Some of you... As you introduced yourself, have some salty tongues. Uh, I, I, I'm really excited for this. I, I truly believe that one of the people that we're going to have on this stage is going to beat Jay Inslee. I just, I have one question though. Which one is it going to be? And that's what we're going to try to find out tonight. Please welcome to the stage the five candidates. Come on out, Joshua Freed. Tim Iman, Anton Sakharov, Phil Fortunato, and Lauren Culp. Thank you guys, let's have a seat. We're all pretty confident that one person up here is actually going to beat Jay Inslee. The question we're gonna try to answer tonight is who is going to be the candidate who is sort of best served to be the Republican candidate. So I thought we would open with a little bit of a standard question of why we're running. But let's talk first, Tim. In your position, you are the king of initiatives. There's no doubt about that. You have some very popular ideas that people like. Sometimes they get implemented. Sometimes people stand in the way. But there's a little bit of a wrap with you. You've got some legal problems. You've also got some branding issues you like to promote. So are you the best person to actually take on Jay Inslee, the, the guy who's branding himself, Tim Iman, constantly? Well, uh, hey, thanks everybody for uh, coming out. I really appreciate it. Um, I think the biggest thing that I would emphasize is that I've just been through the ringer. Uh, for 20 years, I've been fighting for the taxpayers, and for 20 years, I've been attacked for it. And I'm still here, I'm still fighting, and I honestly think that the, uh, every time they take a shot at me, I get stronger. And that's the only way you can possibly survive in the snake pit of politics is that you have to be able to take the hits and continue to move forward. And for 20 years with all these initiatives, the opponents have always made it about me. And I've always waited that this is going to be different because I'm a candidate now. It feels exactly the same. Uh, so I feel like I've had a 20-year internship uh, running for this office, and, uh, and I'm really having a lot of fun, great people, uh, uh, everybody's incredibly uh, supportive, and, uh, and I really do uh, mean this, is that the voters will decide in August who they wanna choose. And so I really feel very strongly that the people on this stage are not the problem. Jay Inslee is the problem, and that's where I'm gonna keep my focus. Lauren Culp, Chief of Police in Republic. You are doing an amazing job in Republic through your career, and you've gotten a lot of national attention. We, I'm not the only one who goes on Fox News, apparently. Uh, you do as well. But you're best known for gun rights. Obviously, if you're going to take on Jay Inslee, it has to be a little bit more about gun rights. So why are you best suited to take on Inslee? Right, definitely more than just gun rights. I'm the law and order candidate uh, for governor of this state. Um, I've been calling it like I see it from the very beginning of my campaign. Um, in my announcement speech back in July, I talked about this so-called homeless crisis, which I don't believe is a homeless crisis totally. It's more about addiction and mental health. And I've said that from day one, even when the other candidates were talking about building homes for the people living on the street, just like Jay Inslee was. But there's many more um, subjects that I cover um, a lot of them are covered on my website as well. And uh, I'm having meet and greets all around the state, talking to people about all the issues that are important to us. And the word's getting out. 
Um, I'm not just the Second Amendment guy, although I believe that's very important, and that's what um, a lot of people know me about because they saw me on Tucker Carlson. But so many more issues, Stan and I, I can't wait to get into them. And thank you all for being here tonight. We'll be getting into those issues. Anton Sakharov, businessman, has an amazing backstory, a personal story. You've got experience in business and management, but at the same time, you've got low name recognition. So why should we decide to go with you to take on Jay Inslee when some other people up here have higher name recognition? Well, uh, good evening, Jason. Good evening, everybody. I will start off with the biggest threat to this nation and to this state is socialism. And I have seen socialism. I can feel it a mile away, and I can stop it. Now, I'm going to be using my management and leadership experience in my private career to solve many of the state's problems that we're all facing. And I will use that to, you know, use my experience to tackle that. Now, remember, King County needs 41% to vote Republican this November. Me being a legal immigrant and a proud American in high tech with zero controversy makes me the best candidate to get those votes in King County. And this will help us flip the whole state, but will also help carry many of the Republican seats down ballot that we desperately need. That is why I believe I'm the best candidate out there. Phil Fortunato, state senator, Republican from Auburn. You are a rare breed as someone who actually represents the people in Olympia with an R next to your name from King County. Uh, at the same time, is it possible that Auburn is just sort of an outlier for communities and you're too conservative for the rest of King County? Why should they go with you? So my name is Phil Fortunato. I'm the state senator, as he said, in the 31st uh, legislative district. I want to be the next Republican governor. And in a year when every Republican uh, senator in King County ran away from Trump, I got two percentage points higher than I ever got before. So in a year when everybody else ran away from Trump and every Republican lost in King County, I gained two points. Now, you don't do that by not having a message that reaches across a, a wide spectrum. I've been very successful in detaching the R from the issues, by focusing on the issues. One time, for example, I had a town hall meeting, and I only advertised this town hall in precincts that I lost. The Politico said this was an extremely bad idea. And I said, well, I, I, everybody came in. I said, here's the issue. Here's what they say the solution is. Here's what I think. What do you think? And we went, I purposely picked the four most controversial issues. So as we went through these issues, and I went back to Olympia, and all the politicos were going, this is a bad idea, you shouldn't do this, and all that stuff. So they asked me, how'd it go? I said, man, it's a disaster. By the time I was done, everybody agreed with me. <laughs> right? Now, uh, I purposely made my issue, my announcement in downtown Seattle, focusing on the homeless issue. The homeless issue in downtown Seattle is the key to winning this race. As Anton points out, you need to get that vote actually from 22% to 32% in Seattle, which will raise the King County vote in order to win. Uh, the, if you look at my contributions, the first $30,000 in contributions I got all came from Seattle because we focused on that issue. Now, it's a mental health issue, it's a drug and alcohol addiction issue. And I recently did a press conference in Olympia on, uh, on homelessness. And one of the newspapers guys says, so you want to criminalize homelessness? Because I said, you've got to get these people that are criminals off the street. They're criminals. And they accused me of wanting to criminalize homelessness. I said, I want to criminalize criminality. These people are criminals. You've got to get them off the street. Now, in addition to that, Supreme Court said, you can't get these people off the street if there's not a place to go. So I said, OK, we're going to give you a place to go. I sponsored the Shelter Act. We're gonna get you off the street, we're gonna provide a place for you to go, we're gonna provide the counseling and treatment and all that other stuff. Now, if you, and with a police presence, no drugs, no alcohol. The Democrats wouldn't give it a hearing because they said there was no evidence by denying them drugs and alcohol that you're helping these people. 
And, and I said, well, there's plenty of evidence saying that if you take taxpayers' dollars and you use that to supplement their drug and alcohol problems, you're not helping the issue. Case in point, $675 million on the state, a billion dollars in King and Pierce, uh, and, uh, uh, King County and, and Seattle on the homeless issues. They haven't done anything. So you got to get these people off the street. Now, and we're going to get into the homelessness. Okay. All right. Well, but, but anyway, so uh, I'll, I'll finish up with this. The, there's many issues. There's transportation funding. How are you going to fund transportation and some of these other issues? But I'll leave you with this. It's been 115 years since we had a bearded governor, and that's too long. <laughs> I feel like everyone is now going to grow a beard in the coming weeks. Joshua Freed, you are a former mayor for the city of Bothell. You are a small business owner. You're very polished. The folks I talk to, they'll also say you're a little moderate. And I'm wondering if you're trying to become the Republican nominee. Are you Republican enough to take on Jay Inslee? Well, obviously, I'm sitting at the far right. <laughs> so further right than anyone else. You're on my left. <laughs> It's the audience, you are the voters, and so to you, I am to the far right. But Jason, thank you so much for putting on this event tonight. Thank you so much for 770 KTTH. What an amazing radio station to be able to broadcast our message out across the Puget Sound. I think this is one of the most exciting times to be a Republican. Look, we have a president where we have 158 million jobs. We have the lowest unemployment rate in 52 years. We have trade agreements with China, trade agreements USMCA with Canada and Mexico, which is good for Washington State. I just wish that Jay Inslee would make be, be potentially work with the administration. I don't know if you heard about the tweet last night where Pence reached out and said, hey, just want to make sure we can work together on coronavirus. And then he, Jay Inslee threw out this absolute insult. We have a governor that doesn't want to work with our federal leadership. To us, that hurts our state. I'm one who likes to pu pull people together and making sure that we're collaboratively working together. I have uh, four of my five kids here. My wife of 23 years is with my daughter in California tonight, missing it. But we love to go serve around the world, to pull people together for a certain cause or mission, to make sure that people who are suffering, the most vulnerable among us, are truly getting the help that they need. And today, in Washington State, there's a lot of people that are suffering, whether it's people are struggling for mental health issues, the developmentally disabled, other people in addiction. We need to address this through, of course, laws and then proper recovery programs. But I believe that running for governor, implementing solutions for our state, we need diverse ideas. And I have that diverse experience to address those ideas. And I believe that I'm best prepared to do that in November. So I, I, I asked you if you were Republican enough. <laughs> Tim Iman. Are you a Republican? Because you originally ran as an independent. You left it up to your supporters to decide. What if they had said, no, we don't want you running as a Republican? Well, for the last 20 years, I've been going to all the conventions for the Republican Party. I've gone to the national convention. But I really, uh, initially, my first reaction was all of our initiatives, the reason they are passing is because we didn't stop at Republicans. We reached out to those independents. We reached out to Democrats. There's still a segment of the Democratic Party that isn't completely nuts yet. We've, we've learned to identify those people. And with those initiatives, they wouldn't have passed without everybody. But after I announced, I was just overwhelmed by the grassroots of the Republican Party. We had uh, uh, people that I've known, uh, just family, friends. Uh, Dave McMullen from Pierce County goes the hard sell and, and uh, really goes hard on me. And, and I got that feedback. And I really want to emphasize this. That's the kind of governor I would be. I wouldn't just sit in a room and make all decisions on my own, the way Jay Inslee basically said, we shall have no death penalty anymore, just unilaterally doing it on his own. I believe that we have a governor that just isn't listening to us anymore. He's listening to himself. His priority is himself. He runs for president on this vanity tour, squandering $5 million, and then he comes back to Washington State with his tail between his legs because only 0% of his fellow Democrats wanted him to be president. I could have told him that for free. So I fundamentally believe that the emphasis we need to have is not just pushing for Republicans. We need to get those independents and all those Democrats that are voting for all these initiatives. And I believe that I'm uniquely qualified to be able to do that because I've been doing it for 20 years. Senator Fortunato, should there be any concerns that he did not immediately run towards the Republican Party the way that you immediately ran to Donald Trump? Well, 
repeat that? Wait, what? Are you, are you concerned that he didn't run initially as a Republican? Should any of yeah, us be concerned? A little bit. Uh, you know, either you know you're a Republican or you're, or you're not. However, I will preface that by saying, when I ran in 2014, I ran as an independent Republican, and people say, oh, you're not really a Republican. I go, well, the reason I ran as an independent Republican at the time was my Democratic opponent was an independent Democrat. <laughs> and so when the newspapers called me up and said, what's an independent Republican? I go, well, hang up the phone and call my Democratic opponent and ask him what an independent Democrat is and then call me back. <laughs> and he never called me back. So, so there is a reason for some of that sometimes. So. Uh, Anton, you know, you talk about the dangers of socialism. At the same time, that actually might be pushing away Seattle voters uh, directly away from you who seem to embrace socialism. So are you, who, who are you going after with that message? I think we have to be true to who we are. We are Republicans, and we have to gear towards a Republican voter, many of whom have not voted. We've seen a lot of brand new voters that never voted in their life when they voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And I believe it's time for Washington State to get those people who have not voted before to actually go out and vote Republican for Donald Trump and for down the ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the only way to actually win. I think playing these games of, well, can we appeal this group to that? We can't appeal to Democrats. That's impossible, right? The only way to do is actually get excitement going in our state to get those who are conservative, who are Republicans, haven't voted before to actually go out and vote in droves. Joshua. Joshua Freed, can you appeal to Democrats? Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I think we have to do that as a Republican Party. When you look at our state as a whole, 43% identify as Democrats, 37% identify as Republicans. If we got all the Democrat votes and all the Republican votes, we lose. So tonight, the voters need to decide which candidate can be best represent you as the Republican Party, but also appeal to independents, and then Democrats that are looking for new leadership. I've heard from a lot of Democrats that are not looking to Jay Inslee this next November. They want new leadership in the state. They don't think that he deserves his third term. Look, at he has a negative 57% disapproval in this state. We have 39 counties. Only one county supports him today. That's King County. When I travel around Eastern Washington or North Washington, those voters are looking for people who would absolutely represent them, and they don't feel that Jay Inslee is doing that today. And so I feel that I'm best suited to be able to reach across the aisle, pull people together, which is why the issues that I'm focusing on are trying to really create a big tent. That's how we win, and that's how I'll lead here in Washington State. Chief Lauren Culp, how about you? Are you better suited to bring together a coalition than anybody else up here? Absolutely, Jason. I'm hearing from uh, people who tell me that they're Democrats, never thought about voting for a Republican, have always voted Democrat. Uh, but they see what I stand for. They've come to hear me speak. They've read my book, American Cop, and they are sick and tired of what Jay Inslee and the far left has done. Um, they've gone too far left too fast, and they're sick and tired of it, and they're telling me that they're voting for me. And I had a lady just the other day. I was at the uh, Puyallup Sportsman Show, and a lady came up to me and introduced herself, said that she spent the $15 to get into the Sportsman Show. She doesn't hunt her fish but she spent the $15 to come in and meet me in person and give me the message that I just said. She's a lifelong Democrat, never thought about voting for a Republican, but she loves what I stand for and that I stood up for the people um, that I work for, and she's voting for a Republican for the first time in her life. And she's not the only one. I'm getting emails from a lot of people saying the same thing. May I, may I dive in? One thing that I think is very important for us to always remember is we are all taxpayers first. Democrat, Republican, Independent, we are all taxpayers. It is the unifying issue in my mind over the last 20 years with every initiative we've done, and you have to treat voters that way. You can't do it based on party. You have to do it and appeal to them. I remember uh, talking to a public union hall, and I remember saying, asking the audience, how many in here are voting no on $30 tabs? Every hand went up, and I go, half of you are lying, and you know it. And the point I was trying to make is that in the privacy of the ballot booth, we have the opportunity to be able to get people to vote 
our way as long as we're promoting the ideas that they agree with. Not promoting our party first, but instead concentrating on the issues that unify us. And taxes is a big one. Our initiatives have saved taxpayers $43 billion over the last 20 years. Eight years of Jay Inslee has cost us $50 billion. Look at that contrast. We have somebody there raising your taxes 50 billion and somebody that's been fighting for 20 years to lower them 43 billion. That is a unifying message. It's not the only message, but I'd say that $30 tabs is the perfect model that you have for a winning campaign that I would have as governor. Let's talk about $30 car tabs. I feel like most people here should we do the raising of the hand if you supported uh, 976? So obviously- well, you've the, confused <laughs> though. How many people were confused by it? So the, the fate of 976 is a little bit up in the air. Obviously King County judge surprised a lot of us by siding with 976. Ultimately it's probably going to go to the Supreme Court where it's anyone's guess. Uh, let's talk, uh, Senator Fortunato, you had pointed out on my show that you thought there was some problems with the way 976 was written, specifically that it had too many topics in it. You introduced legislation to try to fix that, uh, stalling, obviously, because Democrats are in control. D did Tim Iman do that the right way? No. Tell us why. <laughs> so, uh, everybody here, $30 car tabs. How many people like that? $30 car tabs. How many, how many people wanted to repeal the extra little bit of sales tax that was on the sale of motor vehicles? How many people here voted to do the sales tax on rental cars? How many people voted to repeal transportation benefit districts? I mean, all, and then, and then the, uh, the bonding with Sound Transit. People voted for $30 car tabs. That's what they voted for. Now, that happens to be a, the biggest portion $496 million is the total, uh, total hit. I think the $30 car tab portion is about 300 and something million dollars. So what I did was I ran a clean bill. People wanted $30 car tabs. That's what this is, $30 car tabs. No ambiguity, no multiple subjects, uh, none of that stuff. If the initiative was ran as a bill in the, in the legislature, it would have been come up on scope and object because sales tax from the sale of motor vehicles doesn't have anything to do with car tabs. So, uh, I mean, that's, I think, the ultimate vulnerability of, of the uh, piece of legislation. So had it just been $30 car tabs, great. Single subject, no ambiguity, no challenge in the court, everybody would have been happy. So I, How'd you I, vote on 976? I voted yes, hell man, I want $30 car tabs just like everybody else. <laughs> well, so, Tim Iman, then, t to that criticism, did you throw just too much in? Were you not paying attention to some of the finer details of how these initiatives, as the king of initiatives, d did you not pay that close attention? Or do you think that that's a, a ridiculous claim? As I, said, I was looking, the people at home listening on the radio could not see yes. your face. I, I understand. <laughs> in April of 2018, Karen and I sold off our retirement fund and we loaned a half a million dollars in order to kickstart the signature drive. Trust me, this is the biggest risk of my life. Would I really have done that unless I felt confident that it would actually fulfill what the voters were about to vote for, which is that you would actually write a check for $30? That faith that I had in voters was rewarded because we got enough signatures, because people in this room, and especially people like uh, Dave, who heads up the Pierce County Republican Party, embraced it, loved it, got the signatures, got it qualified. For an entire year, they beat the crap out of this idea. They spent $5 million saying, vote no on Tim Iman's $30 tabs initiative. Took tons of hits during that. The voters voted for it. Very important point, this judge, who I had no faith in, because he was a Jay Inslee appointee, said, I think maybe voters were confused. He changed his mind. He said, no, voters weren't confused. He's now largely upheld the initiative, and one week from today, he is going to lift the injunction, and our car tabs are going to drop, because I had faith that we did it correctly. I believe that the voters knew what they were voting on, it was to get the tabs down to $30, and that involves transportation benefit districts and all these other governments that are imposing them. I believe the voters deserve what they vote for, and if it takes one more vote, it's voting for me in November, and I will get you those $30 tabs if that's what it takes.
Joshua Freed, in a world where $30 card tab fees actually gets to go into effect, how do we fund some of the transportation projects that are important to you in Bothell, but important across the state? Uh, well, that we have plenty of money in Olympia. The issue is not having plenty of money. I mean, under Jay Inslee, even though he promised not to increase taxes, he's done so to the tens of billions of dollars. Under Jay Inslee, we've seen the state budget increase by 60%. Just last session, increased by 17%. So there's just this insatiable desire for new taxes in Olympia and overspending that's coming under Jay Inslee's watch. And the result of that is people are frustrated. They're not feeling that they're being represented. They're being taxed, but not properly represented. Whereas I've been traveling in the state, people are expressing a lot of concern. I think a big big show that the state of Washington is turning was the last election. And when nine out of the 12 advisory votes were overwhelmingly rejected, where $30 tabs went forward and was passed, I think the message is we're tired of the overtaxation, we're tired of the overspending, and we need, need new representation in the state of Washington. And thankfully, Jay Inslee is vulnerable, and he needs to be removed so he can go focus on other things rather than trying to run our state. He's dismally failed. When everyone looks around the state of Washington, you can see the failure all around us. He's not listening. People are suffering. A lot of people are being left behind. Crime is rampantly on the rise. And so it's time to have a governor that's willing to listen around the state. Actually, when I become governor, I'm going to open up regional offices in central Washington, eastern Washington, and north Washington. Those will be places where I'll have regional representatives and also allow people to remote testify to Olympia. Because Phil knows quite well that it's difficult when people are in eastern side of Washington to drive down and share yeah. their concerns with Phil. So as governor, I'm going to make sure the full state of Washington is not rep or is represented, not just the 50 miles north and south on I-5. Anton Sakharov. <laughs> One of the points from your campaign is you know how to cut things that are inefficient. Now, to Joshua's point, Democrats in Olympia have very clearly decided to earmark all of the record revenues coming in to the state of Washington. So something's going to have to be cut. Where would you start? Well, let's come back to the $30 car tab. Last time I checked my car tabs, they were $30. But then there were all the fees that we're paying. And guess what? If that $30 car tab initiative does not get through, or I mean, it does get through, we'll have another tax coming up later. Right? The problem is not the $30 tabs. The problem is that they're hooked up on taxes, and they want to spend your money, and we need to push back and say no. Now, I, I clearly said I, I have seen socialism, and one of the symptoms of socialism is government control, right? It could be government control through uh, basically telling you what to do, what to buy, but it could be the taxes they're collecting. The minimum wage is another government control. The, the rent cap that they just put in in Seattle is another government control. Right? All these pieces are the start, starting blocks of socialism that's coming here. So it's not about stopping 30, you know, getting our $30 tabs, because after that, if we're successful, we'll have something else. Uh, we, have, we do have a spending problem, absolutely. And one of the first things I want to do is open up the, and make all the state projects transparent to the public. I want to audit the state projects. I want to cut regulations to allow smaller companies to actually get in and bid on state projects to cut the cost down, uh, and also be smart about how we're spending. Set real goals. All of our agencies right now throughout the state don't have real goals. Their, their goal is, you know, you can pick any agency. Let's, let's pick well, an Let's pick WashDOT then. So Washington State Department of Transportation. What is a goal that they need to have as it relates to spending? I, I, we live within the means. I think that, and it has to do with every single agency across the state, right? It has to be live within the means and make sure that they're actually representing the will of the people, right? Making sure that we are not stuck in traffic because that we're we're causing you know time delay, we're money loss, we're actually polluting the air, and at the end of the day, all agencies are working for us, and that's why I'm coming in as a governor. I want to make sure that every single agency in our state is working for all of us representing the needs of the people, not special interests, not the select few. That's why one of my uh, campaign slogans is Real Washington, because I'm, I want to say that I want to represent every single county within Washington equally. So, Lauren Culp, Chief Culp, to, to that point then, you know, obviously we all say we want to live within our means, but it's, things would still need to be cut, and oftentimes 
depending on who's in power in Olympia, that means Seattle projects, King County projects are going to get a lot of attention, and they're not paying attention to Republic. They're not paying attention to Kelso and Vancouver and Longview. So how do you ensure then when we make the cuts that you know, there are communities that are not forgotten? Well, Jason, I'm, I've been a, not only a chief of police and a police officer for the last 10 years, but I was a small business owner for over 20 years in the Olympia area. I ran a construction company there. Started it from nothing, built it up to several crews and several vehicles. My son still runs that business right now. So I know um, the pain in the butt that state government is with taxes and regulations. And I know how to run a business. I will go through every department. I know that there's a lot of redundancy in, in the state. Um, in pretty much every department, there's a lot of waste. And there is some corruption. I know several people that work in different departments, and I know that the waste is rampant. I mean, we can, there's gonna be so many cuts on spending in different departments that it's not even gonna be funny. You know, we're gonna start initially of letting people retire um, to cut down. There's, there's like 117,000 state employees, and how many did something for you today, right? So we need to look at the broad picture um, and come up with the solutions to cut back on the state spending and, and what they do. We don't need a big bloated state government lording over us with their hand on our shoulder and their other hand in our pocketbook. We need to get back to freedom and liberty in this state and that can't be done with a big bloated government hanging over us. Senator Phil Fortunato, how how much are Republicans responsible for some of the bloat? Well, I think we've done a really good job at uh, uh, the last budget we did in 2017 was pretty, uh, pretty well done. Uh, the biggest problem I have with our caucus and the, uh, our, the Senate caucus, great budget, very detailed, did a great job, but they started with their end game. They started with the, the end result of what they wanted. I said, now the Democrats in 2017 in the House started with plus $8 billion. So we're negotiating against the Democrats in the House from where we wanted to finish, but they were $8 billion in more taxes. I said, when they did the presentation on the budget, I said, this is a great budget. What do we got to give up? I go, when you negotiate, you can't start from a reasonable position. You have to start from an unreasonable position because you're going to give something up. And in the end, they gave up tax on bottled water and some other things, right? So they still got $300 million in new taxes uh, in 2017. But I want to touch on, you know, a lot of times we go to these forums and people simply repeat the problem. We need to do this. We need to do that. Everybody knows that. The question is, is how are you actually going to do it? So there was a program in place under uh, some years ago. It's called the Productivity Board. And what the Productivity Board did was it gave state employees a, a bonus if they found government waste. Now, that program cost $2 million. And it was cut because it cost $2 million. You know why it cost $2 million? Because they paid bonuses to state employees who saved $20 million. So, I said, this is government logic. I go, if you're a state employee, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, state employees come to me all the time, they're taxpayers, they're griping about the same thing everybody else is. They're going like, you wouldn't believe the stupid things they make us do at work. You know? And I go, well, the productivity board said, fill out this thing, submit it to a, a, a separate entity. You're not gonna submit this idea to your boss because your boss doesn't wanna cut his budget. The next thing you know is agency is gonna get cut. No boss is gonna do that. So you submit it to an outside uh, uh, review board. They come up and say, yes, this will save money. An example is, instead of putting the, the, the detail, the decal, state decal on doors of the cars and then repainting the doors before they sold the cars, they put the decal on the window, save $2 million. Stupid little things like that. There's government waste, but nobody could find it. It's like trying to find one black marble in a 55-gallon drum. But you take that same principle and you apply it towards education. We're spending 26 plus billion dollars on education, and a school district comes into my office and says, I need $3 million for special ed. I open my draw, I pulled out a list of 1,477 regulations, I handed it to the school board member and I said, 
find something that costs $3 million that you don't want to do. Right? And she looked at me. And now, a small businessman, if I raise your taxes, a small businessman is in my office banging on my desk. You raise my taxes. I want this cut. But a school district comes in my office and says, I have this new regulation. I need $3 million. Are you doing something now that doesn't contribute to the education of the child? Oh, we're doing all this stupid stuff. Well, stop doing it. You know, I go, why doesn't anybody come into my office and say, I don't want to do this stupid stuff? So I came up with a, uh, uh, a bill. It was a, um, uh, a, a school district comes up with an idea that they don't want to do something that doesn't contribute to the education of the child. They can request a waiver. Now, and they, and they said to me, what happens if we don't get this waiver? I said, it's actually not so important that you get the waiver. What is important is that you send a message to Olympia. And I said, I would expect all rural school districts to be complaining about something. All urban school districts to Do be complaining about something. Do we need to start raising something. hands by any chance? <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, we'll uh, uh, but that gives you some information in order to make decisions to actually cut the budget. So we'll go to Tim in a moment. Joshua, you are a small businessman, is what he's saying. Does that make sense? And does that mean you should be getting this job? Oh, absolutely. I think it comes down to experience. You asked a few different questions that I want to jump in on a few of them, but I served on Bothell City Council for 12 years, and I served as mayor there. After 12 years, I never had to vote for one tax increase, yet as mayor, I oversaw the largest revitalization of a downtown in Washington State. We had $450 million worth of investments come into the city of Bothell. My, I invite you to come there today. Buy Bothell. It's amazing what we've done downtown. We need to have a governor who thinks from a position of an investor. If we're doing expenditures, we need to see a return on that investment, where today we see a billion dollars, for instance, spent on the homeless industrial complex, and yet we see the problem only growing. You need to have solutions when it comes to transportation like you're talking about. I used to serve on the East Side Transportation Partnership, and I would pound my fist on the table saying, as we would hear from WashDOT as they would come from Olympia up to Bellevue and talk to the East Side Transportation Partnership, they would give all these pet plans, talk about transit, talk about light rail, bus rapid transit, and I would say, we need congestion relief. We must have a goal of congestion relief. You know, this year they're removing that term down in Olympia. Why is there no requirement of congestion relief? You know, under Jay Inslee, we've seen congestion increase by 108% in seven years. I think we all felt it tonight, did we not? Unbelievable. And we have a broken ferry system today. So many ferries are constantly broken down. We haven't had new roads added to I-5 or 405 through the King County and Snohomish County area, yet the population has increased by 900,000 over the last seven years. We have a governor who doesn't even go to Washington, D.C. to lobby for our federal dollars for our roads. We receive one of the lowest amounts in the nation from the federal government that we pay our, our taxes to. That needs to change. And as governor, I'll make sure that we work with the Trump administration or any presidential, um, well, Trump's going to win. That's quite clear. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> who, who called you the moderate? Oh, so, Tim, Tim yeah. I've been jump in on, on that. And, you know, to the point of congestion relief, Democrats wanted to take it out. didn't quite pass, but they're clearly going down that pathway, and they're pushing carbon-free, uh, uh, eco-friendly modes of transportation, which clearly the market's already kind of going down, which does bring us back to the question of, if you're not getting enough in gas taxes, we're cutting down to $30 card tap fees, you do still have to figure out where you're paying for everything. I think it's really important that the only way we're ever going to be able to make a difference is to actually get somebody elected. And we have had a struggle trying to actually elect somebody that is going to be able to galvanize and get people excited. The one thing I've learned with initiatives is you really need to stay focused. And I believe that government is never going to prioritize when it's fat and happy. The only time they prioritize is when tax reduction is actually on the table. Right now, Jay Inslee has raised taxes $50 billion over the last eight years. Yet he's not listening to us because he's pushing a carbon tax, he's pushing a paper mile tax, he's pushing income taxes. There's literally no limit to the, what he wants. I have said that I will veto any tax increase, and I mean any tax increase. I believe we're already paying enough in taxes, but I think that doesn't go far enough. I have heard nothing but people complaining about property taxes. And property taxes are going through the roof because of one person, and that was Jay Inslee. Jay Inslee signed into law one of the largest property tax increases in Washington state history, and guess which proposal this was? 
This is the exact same one that he criticized Rob McKenna for suggesting in 2012. In other words, Jay Inslee said, I will veto any tax increase. He raises taxes 30 times over the last eight years. He says he's against this property tax proposal, yet he raises property taxes dramatically. I believe it is time for Washington State to have a Prop 13, Washington style, cap the growth of property taxes, but reduce them. How many people in here want their property taxes reduced? Anton Sakharov. You have to go on offense, people. At the same time, though, you know, let's be clear. There have been voters who have passed tax increases in their individual elections. We've seen property taxes go up, sales taxes go up all across Washington State. So where's the disconnect? Well, let me start off with, I was the first one who proposed that we're, I'm not going to have an income tax in Washington State. I was the first one to propose that I want to cut deaths and estate recovery taxes. I was the first one to propose that we should cap the real estate taxes so that they don't keep growing because as we know, a lot of people are on fixed income in our state and they're being forced out of their homes because they can't afford the real estate tax. Um, I, what my proposal is, we can reduce taxes yet get our budget on track by bringing in new business that doesn't exist today in our state. There's ways to do it. We need to incentivize businesses to come to our state to bring new jobs, new businesses, while at the same time cutting the taxes for all of us here. Also, I want to reduce the costs that we're seeing, right? It's not always about paying for things through taxes. We can also cut costs. And I want to get to the point where we are negotiating all the state projects. We have competition between companies who are offering us best rates to cut the cost down and pass it back to us. So let's switch gears to talk about gun rights, which is very, very important. We've done a few uh, freedom series on this. Tim Iman just patted Lauren Culp on the leg for that one because <laughs> Lauren Culp is, uh, you know. Uh, so. Lord Culp, Chief Culp, let's talk about gun rights. Is there any restriction that you support? Well, is there any restriction on the First Amendment that anyone would support here? No. No. no, I didn't think so. So why would anybody want a restriction on any of the other amendments, right? <laughs> it's very simple. When God gives you your rights, which we know from the, Declar uh, from the Declaration of Independence that our rights come from our Creator, correct? And if anybody wants to take those rights away from you uh, that God gave you, I would consider that evil, period, right? So why would we talk about restricting any of our God-given rights? I, I don't think that we need to, as well, long as you're not harming anyone else. Yeah. Well, let, let's, though, dive into that a little bit, because when we're talking about the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, there certainly are some restrictions that have been deemed constitutional. Is your position that they're all unconstitutional? Any sort of re restriction, a reasonable one, as deemed by the courts? Well, if you walk into a theater and yell fire, obviously you're, you're endangering other people, right? Um, if you... Why is that not my First Amendment right? Because you're, you're placing other people in danger by having them possibly trample each other, leaving the scene of a fire that's not really there. And so th that's a limitation on your First Amendment right, right? You can't just go in and, and cause havoc by screaming out there's a fire in a theater. Um, but as long as you're not harming someone else or creating a danger for other people, then what restrictions would someone want? I mean, there's people that own tanks in this country that actually shoot. Um, I, I've never heard of anyone um, having a problem with that. The parking fee in my apartment in Seattle is way too expensive to handle that. Uh, Tim Iman, on guns, I don't know where you stand. What's your position to just give us just sort of a 30,000 foot level for 30 seconds on the Second Amendment? I get a whole 30 seconds? 30 seconds. So kind. The Second Amendment, it says, shall not impair. Shall not impair this right. I believe that, the, and what is so frustrating to me and it so angers me is that these are guaranteed rights. Guaranteed means you shouldn't have to worry about voting Republican versus Democrat. This is a given and it doesn't matter who you vote for. But Jay Inslee and Bob Ferguson 
literally don't care that these are guaranteed rights. This is one of their top priorities, is stripping away basic rights for people to personally protect themselves, law-abiding citizens. It's so frustrating to me that you have to vote Republican in order to be able to have a guaranteed right. I would veto anything that would infringe on the Second Amendment. I believe that the Seattle-centric legislature that we have are gonna keep pushing this kind of crap until somebody says no, and I would say no to that. Did, and, did you think it went too far to ban bump stocks? Oh, I thought that was stupid. Uh, <laughs> seriously, this was like, it was so annoying. All the stuff that they've been doing. I mean, Lauren, I think, is, you know, I'm sorry. He, he's the guy. Uh, you know, no one's even going to top him. Uh, but I think it's an important point, is that when they started talking about capping the number of mags that are in a, in a clip, is so stupid because it is just as stupid as saying, well, you can have 30 word sentences, but you can't have 15 word sentences. I mean, it, this limits on basic rights, just like the First Amendment, he really nailed it. It is so stupid for them to be putting these arbitrary caps on it when it's very clear in the state constitution, which is stronger, that says shall not impair these rights. And the thing is, Jason, you know, the the left always talks about safety, and we want to save the kids, right? And that's why they want gun control. Well, if making another law is going to make anybody safer, then why, why hasn't the law against murder taken care of the problem already, right? So criminals, criminals do not obey the law. That, that's why they're criminals. Laws are put in place to punish them when they do break the law. But you can't restrict law-abiding citizens and expect to have any influence on the criminal element. If someone's intent on doing evil to someone, they're going to do evil. It doesn't matter if it's a rock, a stick, a bat, or a car. There are far more people killed with hands and feet, according to FBI statistics, than there are with rifles of any type. Joshua Freed, are, are they too extreme on the Second Amendment? Oh, I think they're... Are limitations. I don't want felons to own guns. I think if you've proven that you are somebody who doesn't honor the law, that you should not be given the right to carry a firearm to continue to threaten people. We live in a state today where we've seen murder go up by 41% under Jay Inslee. We've seen rape go up by 65%. We live in a lawless society today in Washington State. We just saw recently where two Guys, we're shooting nine-year-old kids down at McDonald's in downtown Seattle. They've been arrested 70 times, yet we have Trump during the State of the Union address. He points up to the gallery and says this loved one was murdered by somebody who had been arrested or convicted five times. That's sadly the JV here in Washington State. That's just a start. We have people that are being arrested 105 times, and yet the default response from the liberals in Seattle and Olympia was not to say we need to make sure these guys that have been arrested 70 times doing the shootings in our street. They need to go to jail. No, the default response was to go down to Olympia and say we need more gun control laws. And this is why, when I become governor, I'm going to establish a public safety and gun control commission to make sure that our gun rights are protected, that we're looking out for our rights that are supported by our state and U.S. Constitution. Senator Fortunato, After th this mass shooting that was done by gang members in Seattle, left one person dead, eight injured, Mayor Jenny Durkin in Seattle came out and said, we have a gun violence problem. Now, a lot of folks in the audience pointed out it seems more like a gang violence problem. And so when you're looking at an issue like that, where some people very clear, especially in King County, do look at this as a gun violence problem, how do you bridge that gap? So uh, uh, first, I want to I, I back up and say a little bit. I have a Washington, Oregon, and Utah carry permit. And the reason you have Utah is that's recognized in 26 other states. Uh, the lieutenant governor banned guns in the gallery, but he didn't ban guns on the Senate floor, so if anything happens, I could shoot back. <laughs> so, so, but, and, and I want to touch a little bit on a bump stock ban. The original bill, if you read the original bill on the bump stock ban, it said, it modified trigger modification devices that allowed you to shoot faster. And I pointed out, I said, uh, that used recoil to cycle. And I said, first of all, I paid $200 to have my trigger modified so I could shoot faster. I go, uh, the, uh, when I went to the sponsor of the bill and I said, this bans every semi-automatic firearm, the response I got back was, what does semi-automatic firearms have to do with recoil? I said, <laughs> 
Well, I don't know. It's just how every semi-automatic firearm works. So what I did was I drafted a bill that actually got national attention that said, if you're a legislator and you want to draft gun bills, you have to pass an inter you have to be an NRA range safety officer. You have to take these criminal justice live fire shooting exercise for each gun that you want to regulate. And you have to pass the test knowing that you know the difference between a caliper and a gauge, right? <laughs> and so, um, but, uh, if you're not willing to go into the belly of the beast to stand up for these, for these rights, I, I went down to downtown Seattle, and I'm the only pro-gun guy on an anti-guns panel. The first half hour of the program was impeaching Trump and banning AR-15s and 30-round magazines. So then they came and they introduced the members of the panel. I'm the little 16-year-old girl that did the walkout. Oh, you're so brave. I go, 16-year-old kids are eating Tide Pods, right? I go... <laughs> I go, so then you had the, you had the lady from the uh, King County, uh, you had King County Department of Health. Uh, we have a program to unload and lock up your gun. And I made the point, I said, that's anti-woman, right? Afterwards, people came up and go, what do you mean it's anti-woman? I said, well, I'm not likely to get attacked going to my car or going home tonight. You're all professional women. You all live at home alone. I said, you go home tonight, you open up your door, you go to go in your apartment, somebody goes to grab you, you get away, you run in your bedroom, you unlock your safe, you load your gun, and you defend yourself. <laughs> and, and they all stood there and looked at me like this had never occurred to them, right? <laughs> but the piece de resistance was at the very end. So if you want to have some entertainment, go to Seattle TV, one word, Civic Cocktails, and in guns, it was like two years ago. At the very end, I said, well, first of all, when they introduced me, I said, a like hundred people in the room, and I go, you know, I'm not so sure this is a pro-Trump, pro-gun group here, right? <laughs> so so um, uh, at the end, I said, let's say we do everything that you guys want. We ban AR-15s, we ban magazines, we do, will your children be safer in school tomorrow? And they all said no. How about in five years? No. Ten years? No. Twenty years? No. So you're all admitting that even if you do everything that you guys want, your children will not be safer. And I said, if someone was to walk into this room right now, when, and you have one minute to assess that person as a threat, and if you don't have a response in one minute, every one of you in this room is willing to have 10, 20, 30 children die before the police get there. And they all went, no! And they go, and they go, you called us murderers. And I said, welcome to the NRA. <laughs> and Todd Sokrov, you're a, a strong Second Amendment supporter. So I do want you to answer the question of when we very clearly have a criminal problem and a gang violence problem, not necessarily a gun problem. But at the same time, here in Tacoma, the former PIO for the Tacoma PD said, we don't have a gang violence problem. They just happen to be gang members involved in interpersonal problems. <laughs> like... What's, from a position of a governor, how do you address what's a local issue? Well, common sense. <laughs> um, Be a little bit more specific. <laughs> so as, as I mentioned, I, I am a concealed carry. I'm a lifetime NRA member. I, I do believe that Second Amendment, just like the rest of the amendments uh, in the Bill of Rights, makes this country unique. Uh, there's no other country like that. And that's why it, it is the best country in the world. But let me ask you, when was the last time a criminal followed the law? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, they don't. And all those infringements are actually hurting the, the, the law-abiding citizens, us. Uh, that is why I, I was the first candidate who actually proposed this real school security. I have three children of my own. I want school secure because I was tired of listening to the politicians promising that they'll, right after the next shooting, they'll, they'll do something. And they haven't done a thing. I want my kids secure. I want to implement real school security at every single school. Uh, and I want to hire veterans as security guards. I think that's totally doable. I spend the time figuring out how much it's going to cost. It is absolutely doable. And that will prevent school shootings. Uh, at the same time, at the local level, I think we need to uh, get back to the basics. Second Amendment is, is in the Bill of Rights. Why don't we teach firearm training in schools? I'm for that. <laughs> Joshua Freed, you and your wife have uh, an entire campaign staff worth of children <laughs> who obviously go to school, so school safety is important to you as well. You know, do, do we want schools with uh, that kind of security, or does it get into the realm of seeming like a prison or seeming unsafe? Uh, 
Uh, that's funny that you bring up my kids. I do have five kids, and if you come to my kickoff next Thursday, uh, March 5th at 7.30 in the morning, you will hear the Von, pa Von Trapp family children sing the Star Spangled Banner. It's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, my wife and I actually enjoy our rights every day when it comes to our gun rights, and actually, apparently, I only have a starter kit, only 25 guns. But I mean, definitely, it's something that the Second Amendment gives us our right. The state um, constitution in the first article gives us that right. Uh, when we have, we need safety in school for sure. And maybe there's different measures where we could have, where we could have make sure that there's a security offer on well, site. Be, be specific. Right? What, what do you think that looks like? Because one of the issues that a lot of people will point out is that, of course, it is incredibly tragic when we have a school shooting. Mm -hmm. They're also rare. And do, do you go one step forward and sort of putting it, everyone in a position where they seem to think that it happens every day by increasing security to an alarming rate? Well, I don't know that has to be terribly alarming. I think that we could have um, metal detectors at the entrance of the schools and we can make sure that we have security officers that are armed on the school grounds. We need to invest in our children. I hope that we get to the point where we can talk about education and some of the spending there. But I am in support of making sure that we have armed security on grounds at schools. And I know at our school, we have a security program where our kids go to school, and so they are definitely well protected, the largest Christian school in Washington State. Now, in some parts of Washington State, particularly King County and Seattle, we have a prolific offender problem. We have Francisco Calderon in Seattle, who's kind of become the face of this issue, 75 convictions after sucker punching someone on Capitol Hill. He goes to jail for a very little bit of time, comes out, throws coffee in a toddler's face, then is supposed to go into drug treatment and doesn't actually do it. In fact, he commits another crime. Lauren Culp, Chief of Police for Republic, let's throw this to you. You know, some of these decisions aren't up to the police and they're not up to the governor. In case of King County, you got Dan Satterberg, King County prosecutor, deciding he's not going to prosecute. So what do you do as governor? And that's one of the big problems with the homeless crisis in the Seattle area is they, they will not prosecute. I believe it's up to six grams of heroin in possession now, which is a felony in this state. Any amount of heroin is a felony, but the prosecutors won't prosecute, so the police don't arrest because it doesn't do any good. That's what's led to this homeless crisis. Um, but what I would like to see, as far as judges go, and you're, you're right, the governor doesn't rule in cases, and the people don't, except the people rule at the ballot box. And what I would like to see, uh, because when you get your voter pamphlet and it's time to vote on judges, how much information do you have you got in there on the judges? Hardly anything, right? I want to know who I'm voting for, but so many times we don't. And who's going to spend the months going through case law to see how they've ruled? I would like to see a set of questions answered by each judge and it be put into the voter pamphlet so we know who we're electing to be the judges over these cases. Tim Iman. Let's talk about this issue as well. I mean, as governor, again, you have limited role in what you can do on the ground in the cases of prolific offenders, but you certainly would have a large microphone to talk. So what would the message be as governor to these prosecutors and to the voters? I really want to touch on judges. Just forgive me, because it really touches home for me. Uh, 1639 was just an atrocious initiative. And I was really influenced by the fact that on the back of the petition, they didn't do it correctly. They misspelled words. They didn't underline the stuff. And I literally drew all the mistakes they made. And said, if this was an Iman initiative, what would happen? And, and I felt very, very proud that I got uh, an exceptionally good attorney uh, that I've always used, uh, hooked up with the Second Amendment Foundation, Alan Gottlieb. And I sat there in court and heard a judge say, this is off the ballot. This should not be voted on. They didn't follow the rules, and I was ecstatic. I'm the initiative guy, but it is atrocious for them to be violating basic rights that were guaranteed and were voting on it. That is nuts. That is so bad. Governors get to name judges. Jay Inslee is naming wacko judges. That's the kind of judges we're getting out of Jay Inslee. One of the greatest things you can get from a governor is actually the opportunity to name some of these judges. What was so frustrating is that 1639 judge who said it's off the ballot, nine Supreme Court justices said he was wrong without oral argument. So I believe, it's so maddening. So I believe that we have a Seattle legislature, we have a Seattle Supreme Court, we've got a Seattle governor, I want us to have at least one branch of government that's looking out for everybody else. Senator Phil Fortunato, let's go in the world in which we have amazing judges. 
but we have people who are dealing with mental illness who are committing these crimes, and we know that simply putting someone who's mentally ill or dealing with an addiction in jail doesn't treat the underlying cause, but at the same time, obviously, you need to punish the, the crime. So what do you do in a situation where someone's very clearly dealing with mental health issues? So you have a, you have a couple of different issues here. One, one, I want to back up a little bit on touch on school safety. So I ran a bill that said, uh, uh, you know, the, the Criminal Justice Training Commission should come up with an active shooter response training program that school districts could use. It should include, uh, uh, you know, de-escalation training and firearms training. Now, at the same time that Governor Inslee was in Washington, D.C., telling Donald Trump no teacher wants to be armed, I'm having a press conference in Olympia with the school district superintendent from Toppenish School District saying, we have armed teachers and administrators, right? So that was hilarious. But um, the, you know, we talked about prosecutors' discretion. That's part of my homeless plan, one of which is we have prosecutors that are not prosecuting, all right? I had a bill that said you get one chance. If you're a prosecutor, you get one chance to prosecute that guy, to determine if you're going to prosecute him or not. After that, you must prosecute these people. Now, that removes the criminal homeless from the street. But you have that additional problem of uh, uh, other people that may have mental illness and, uh, and things like that that are on the street. Currently under state law, if you are a threat to yourself or someone else, you could be removed from the street for evaluation. But what happens if you're not a threat to yourself or someone else, but you're filthy dirty? You know, you're obviously not taking care of yourself. Florida passed what they called the Baker Act. And what that did was add personal hygiene. So now you can remove somebody from the street if they're obviously not taking care of themselves, they got personal hygiene issues, along with that goes the mental health counseling and all that other stuff. So when you pull somebody off the street and you, you incarcerate them for drug and alcohol, I mean, usually these guys are criminals because of drug and alcohol, you have to provide the treatment. These people have screwed things up so much that you have to provide that counseling and treatment. Now, if you come back to the state again, you have to, you know, you have to uh, either stay off drugs and alcohol or you have to leave. So you either come back to this state, we're gonna fingerprint you, you come back, you get arrested again, you're out of here. Um, Senator, who, who pays for this? Where's the money coming from? We're paying from? for it now. We're paying for it when every time these people break into somebody's car, steal somebody's purse, do all that stuff, the cost to society is gigantic trying to manage this stuff. So, um, you know, but again, they have screwed this up. <clears throat> they have created such a magnet. You know, Lauren points out that you could come to Seattle and have cocaine and heroin and everything else and not be prosecuted, uh, shoot up on the street. I said, I had dinner with these uh, three guys from the Korean uh, uh, consulate or not, uh, legislature, and you know what they said to me? Why do you let these people crap on the sidewalk? That's what they said. They didn't say, oh, Seattle's so beautiful, oh, the Space Needle, oh, Puget Sound, oh, the mountains. No, they're going to go back to Korea and say, those people let people crap on the sidewalk, right? And I said, that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with. So you need to get these people off the street. That now, uh, along with that, there's a Supreme Court ruling that says, if you don't you have to have a place to go, fine, we're going to give you a place to go. We're going to provide that shelter, that counseling, and all that stuff. Now, if you don't want to go there and you want to stay on drug al drugs and alcohol, you have to leave. If you came from Kansas, here's a bus ticket. Go back to Kansas. We're not taking taxpayer dollars and spending them for you to continue your dependency on drugs and alcohol. Snohomish County, I think, does a really good job on that. Joshua Freed, when it comes to the individual counties, again, I'm hearing lots of really good ideas of what we'd like to do, but what role do you have as governor in, in implementing? Well, the governor in Washington state has limited executive orders power. And you look at a lot of different states and a lot of governors have a lot of executive power. In Washington state, it's really limited to emergency declarations. So on day one, I'll declare a state of emergency in Washington state. I will. So, okay, well then explain and, and, why that's different than when Seattle, I think now twice has declared states of emergency and Inslee has pretty much done the same thing in language without actually declaring. So well, it, why would that be different with, with you? Well, it comes down to practical ideas and experience, right? And so when I declare a state of emergency, I'll use the resources that I'm allotted as governor and that is to make sure that the state troopers go down to clean underneath the right-of-ways in the Department of Transportation. 
we're all running for office. If we stick a campaign sign in the right of way, it's gone in 15 seconds. And yet today in Washington state, our governor lets people camp underneath our freeways across the state. I've been in Fragile I've been in Olympia, I've been in Seattle, I've even been to Yakima and Spokane. We have a major homeless situation that's happening today where people are going into our homes, they're stealing 35 $35,000 to support their heroin addiction, and our governor seems to look in different ways and talk about climate change, yet he ignores the climates in the streets across our state. People are truly suffering, or our own personal security is being threatened. So we need a governor that's willing to step in and show leadership. And when it comes to controlling counties individually, the next power of the governor comes through veto. Our tax dollars go through Olympia, as Senator knows quite well. Those monies go back to the counties. We can control the money that goes to bad performing counties that aren't protecting its citizens. And that's what I definitely would do as governor. Anton Sakharov, obviously some of these, some of these issues, we've got some solutions, but courts say some of these things aren't okay. In Philadelphia just the other day, there was a court ruling that pretty much cleared the way for heroin injection sites there. We know that in Seattle they've been wanting to do this and they've just been waiting for the courts to decide. If a court decides, yes, we're going to go ahead and allow for heroin injection sites, which is something I don't think anyone on the stage actually supports, what would you do? How would you stand, uh, step up? Well, I think nobody mentioned, uh, as of yet, the biggest power of the governor is the microphone. And you know what I will do? I will represent all of you and make sure that any time there is an event where, you know, as you mentioned, somebody threw a coffee, I, I will speak about it on TV to make sure that the whole state knows what's happening. And I will be on your side. I think that's what's missing right now. It's not about can I fix or that. One person cannot fix the whole state. Okay, but let's say you it, speak out against what Seattle's doing. Seattle says, well, I'm not going to listen to a Republican who hates socialists. So what do, you, what do you do at that point when they inevitably push back? Right. So I... I offered several solutions. One of the main ones is I, I have a complete respect and support of the, our police across the state. I want to make sure that, thank you. I want to make sure that anytime there's a police officer who's actually doing their job, it gets fired by a city or a municipality, the state gets re rehires that police officer to become a state trooper. That will send a clear message to every single town that we will not be okay with what's happening. We are hiring police officers to make sure we have peace on, on our streets, that make sure that our law is followed, and what's happening is not acceptable. I mean, again, I can speak to my experience living in a socialist country where the police officers took bribes, the government officials took bribes, and it was mayhem. We can't have that have on our streets. That's unacceptable. And this is where I'm coming in, and I can sh talk about that experience and talk to the people letting you know that we can't get fall into this trap because we can't ever get out of it once we get in, right? And we have to fight it. We have to fight it, and it's at the election levels. It also is at the, making sure that all the people are understanding that I'm on your side, and I'll be speaking about it publicly so that you can actually be aware that there's somebody, at least within Washington state, protecting you. So Joshua Freed, you, you've been fighting against heroin injection sites uh, in western Washington, it, it got into a little bit of trouble with the courts, deciding that it was mostly a financial situation that you couldn't really change a budget issue. But uh, again, what do you do when Seattle says, you know what, federal law clearly is being interpreted to allow this? Well, thankfully, we have a president today that said he will step in. If they try to open a heroin injection site, he'll shut it down. But it's right. I, my wife and I, were, we were hearing what was happening in downtown Seattle as Seattle City Council and King County Council had the idea to open government-run heroin injection sites sites. So we started Initiative 27 two years ago. We went out, got 70,000 signatures with 1,000 volunteers. We got it qualified for the ballot. We actually went up to Canada five different times. I sat on the streets of East Hastings to visit their heroin injection site. They opened in 2003. There were 190 illicit drug deaths at that point. In 2018, the deaths from illicit drugs had skyrocketed 800%. Yet Seattle City Council and King County Council say that's the model what we want to follow. And so now we see that Seattle City Council never even went up there like I did five different times. So we got it qualified. Then C City of Seattle brought suit against me, Joshua Freed personally, and against I-27 saying, you as voters don't have the right to vote on health-related matters. Really, abortion was legalized 
1970 through the initiative process. Indoor smoking was criminalized. We saw marijuana legalized through the initiative process. So I went before a judge, a very activist judge, like Tim is talking about, who, Judge Galvan, she was appointed by Jay Inslee. She said, you as voters don't have the right. Guys like Rod Dabrowski, who's the head of King County Council Health Advisory Board, he's an attorney. He's the one that truly has the right. So we had to fight that. We appealed it to the state Supreme Court. So it was Joshua Freed versus the city of Seattle and King County. And those nine justices, none of them who ever went up to see the death rate up in Canada, the, the girls selling themselves for dollars for their heroin addiction, and yet they advocated for heroin injection sites in their decision. So we have a broken court system here in Washington State. And the great thing is our president, when you look at what the appointments he's made for judges across the nation in our state Supreme Court, extraordinary. And so as governor, you get to make a lot of appointments, actually 1,500 appointments, not in the courts alone, but across the bureaucracy that he's grown. It's time for the governor that looks to reduce that and appoint judges that are constitutionalist. Chief Lauren Culp, jump in here as well. So how much of this is a policing situation that we just need to make sure that we're making the arrests of people who are you know, shooting up in parks versus where do we go from a, a sort of a health standpoint? Where do we get the, the treatment from? Well, I'm the only candidate up here that um, was a narcotics detective for uh, just over three years. So I've dealt with this on the street level uh, with addicts and with the dealers. And one thing that a lot of taxpayers don't realize um, is that the taxpayers are funding the narcotics trade through the EBT cards. Um, I've never arrested a narcotics dealer, and I've arrested a lot of them. Um, I've never arrested one that didn't have multiple people's EBT cards in their pocket. That's the food stamp card that the state fills up um, every month. And I don't know about where you work, but where I work, I'm required to do random drug testing uh, to make sure that I'm not using drugs at work, even though I'm the chief of police. And I think that if we had random drug testing for people that were on public assistance, expecting taxpayer dollar, that that would be an incentive. That would be an incentive for people to get help, right? And not to punish people, but if someone um, pees dirty and they're on drugs, then we would give them the help that they need. And through my work in police, being a police officer, I've helped many people. And the left think that it, thinks that it's compassionate to not put drug, drug users in jail. But it's exactly the opposite. To, to me, it's, it is compassionate to put them in jail and then get them into treatment, right? It's not compassionate to leave them on the street into that cycle of addiction that they're in. And I've had many people that I've arrested, they've gone through treatment, um, and they've come back and told me that I've saved their life. They, you know, they've gotten their kids back. They've got their home. They got a job. They become a productive member of society again, of our community. And I've had many, many people do that. And that, to me, that's compassion. You know, tough love. We can't just let people um, continue with this lawlessness because if you allow lawlessness like it's going on right now, then you're going to get more of it. And that's what we're seeing with this explosion of lawlessness going on around this state. Is we're allowing this to happen and people in other states that are addicts hear about it and, well, I can go to Seattle or I can go to wherever and not get charged with a crime, I'm going to go there. And that's why we're seeing this big influx. They've created a vacuum for these people. And we can't ignore it. Let's talk about lawlessness and the sanctuary state status that Washington has. For a lot of folks who are in here before that happened, it was the sanctuary county in King County, sanctuary city in Seattle, sort of a sanctuary city in Tacoma, though they didn't really want to call it that. Tim Iman, do you believe that if someone's in this country illegally, but they're not committing an additional crime beyond being in this country and in this state illegally, should they be deported? I think Jay Inslee has really, really screwed up 
uh, when it comes to this. It's really frustrating, and he's doing it to try and impress us at how tough he is and how he's standing up to the federal government. But he's making us less safe by not allowing ICE into the courthouses and the jails where it's actually a controlled environment, where there's actually safety involved. He's making us less safe because now they're doing random street sweeps that are much more dangerous for not only law enforcement, but the general public, as well as the people that they're captured. This whole sanctuary state thing has really blown up in our faces, and it's because Jay Inslee made that decision. I, I went to his first press conference at the earlier part of the year, and I have to circle back to homelessness to show what a failure this guy is. Uh, Jay Inslee was being pummeled with reporters going, what are you going to do about homelessness? When are you going to do something about homelessness? He's saying, oh, I'm going to take $300 million out of the uh, rainy day fund. And you could tell he didn't care. He literally did not care at all about this issue. He was annoyed by it. He was, he was bothered by it. These reporters, first time in my life I ever saw reporters be tough on Jay Inslee. They were pummeling him going, follow-up question. Why don't you declare a national emergency like Joshua was talking about? Why don't you bring in the National Guard? You can do something. You know, it's, you know, climate change. and I mean, he was all over the board, but he did not care. And what's that saying? You know, nobody cares what you know until they know you care. Jay Inslee literally does not care about homelessness, doesn't care about taxes, doesn't care about any of us. His priority is him and anybody on this stage cares about the people of the state of Washington. They want the best for the people of the state of Washington. Jay Inslee does not. Love you, but we're gonna go back to the question I asked. Because on the topic of immigration, on the topic of immigration, look, I mean, when it comes from the Republican Party, there are folks who are in different lanes on this. Some are a hard line approach to if you're in this country legally, you are deported. Others are saying, and I'm, I'll be honest, I'm one of them. If you're a criminal illegal immigrant, meaning you're committing crimes in addition to being here illegally, then I'm okay with the deportation. So if someone is caught with a, a speeding ticket and they're in this country illegally, do you think, are you a hard line de deport? Illegal. Illegal immigration. Yes, if that's what, you, if you're here illegally, you should be sent back. It does not matter if it's serious or unserious. I don't want law enforcement make those kind of determinations. I believe illegal means illegal. Now, I fundamentally think, though, that, you know, let us be very clear. Any of us becomes governor, we're still stuck with this Democrat-controlled legislature. They're not going to be sending us bills that are on this particular topic. They're going to move in our direction. But we are going to be able to push back against that. I think senators like uh, Fortunato have had fantastic bills that address every one of these issues, but they're never even taken seriously because there's no, it's one party rule. And I really emphasize so much to the people of the state of Washington, you have to give these people, hopefully myself, a chance here to show that having split control of your government is better. Idaho, all Republicans, I don't think is good either. All Democrat control, not good. Yeah, good <laughs> well, for you. Well, some people might disagree. Just saying, just saying. I really think it's important. <laughs> if we control the governorship, we can push back and give uh, senators like Fortunato all of his bills a much better chance uh, than what we're having now where it's just not taken seriously. It's very frustrating. Anton Sakharov, legal immigrant. Uh, what is your position on folks who are in this country illegally living in this state if ICE decide, and they're not doing this, but the concern from Democrats, whether or not it's a legitimate concern or they're uh, trying to pander, the concern is that they're literally going to knock on doors, show me your papers. And there's clearly going to be a conversation at some point about dreamers. And so are, are you hardline in saying yes to participating with the federal government or no? At the end of the day, this country is built on law and order. And I think I, we have to follow the laws on the books. There's no exception about it. If we start going around, well, can we interpret this law that way, this law this way, it becomes this huge gray area and it never ends, right? As you mentioned, you know, there's speeding ticket. Well, how fast were you going, right? We can't have that, right? If you broke the law, which is you did when you came here illegally, it's illegal. And this is why I, I mentioned that as soon as I become governor, I will end sanctuary state on day one. That's the plan. Now, now I, I do hope that we do, we do need to prioritize in terms of 
you know, uh, who gets to deport first. Absolutely, to me, criminals have to go who are illegally here. That, that, we can't have criminals who are illegally in this country be back on our streets harming the same neighborhoods they committed the crime before. They need to get out. And we, I want to work with ICE agents. I want to make sure that they get the full support working with our law enforcement within the state. And uh, they are implementing and moving people out that are danger to our society first. Joshua Freed, as governor, when it comes to dreamers, however it's decided, kids who are brought here as children, they're now adults, but they don't necessarily know even the language from their uh, home country. What do you do? Are you backing the federal government regardless of their position? I would back the federal government. Yeah, for sure. Listen, I lived in Egypt, I lived in Pakistan, I've served around the world, been to 46 countries around the world. I think our state is made great by our diversity, but I want to make sure that we're enforcing our laws at the same time. If your parents are coming here illegally, they need to be sent home, no doubt about it. If we create an environment where people just come here and uh, allowed to slip in, that's not appropriate. I think about what Jay Inslee has done by making a sanctuary state. He's not just made us less safe, but he's actually made us more dangerous. Under Jay Inslee, we've seen a assaults go up by 23%. Assaults on police officers. We have a new police officer for the city of Seattle here tonight, which is awesome. Thank you so much for your service, for sure. Yeah. We have an increase of murder of 41% under Jay Inslee, and rape is up by 65%. The population is only increased by 7%. This is how bad it's gotten, and it's like we're in the frog in the water. We're not even noticing what's happening. When Jay Inslee made us a sanctuary state, we've become a hotbed for the sex trade. That means average age 12-year-old boys or girls are sold into the sex trade. That means five and six-year-old kids. Here in Washington, we're not talking like we're in Thailand on Pat Pong. We're talking in Moses Lake. This is unbelievable. And so I want to make sure, oh, by the way, ICE is the leading agency to address the sex trade. I'm not sure if you know that. So when we have violent sexual predators or traffickers in our jails and we're not communicating with ICE, that's a sick perversion, which kind of connects what's happening in Olympia today when you see comprehensive sex education for five-year-old kids. They want to start out to grab our children's mind in a perverted sexual way, and then they want to let 13-year-old girls get abortions without telling their parents. As somebody who's pro-life, I think that's terribly, terribly wrong. And then they want to have Planned Parenthood in our schools so they can compromise their kids at five years old, get them sexually promiscuous, and then at 13 years old, they can kill their babies without the parents ever knowing. This is horrible, and we need to turn this around, and we need to end sanctuary states and make sure that we can turn around the sex trade here and keep young kids safe, keep their minds pure, and move our state forward. Uh, I want to jump... I want to jump into the K through 12 in a second. I want to get the two remaining panelists to talk about sanctuary state status. Obviously, Senator Fortunato, you've tried to pass legislation that would get rid of it. An interesting point, uh, and by interesting, I mean I have no idea what she's talking about, Gail Tarleton, state uh, representative from Seattle. I asked her whether or not it would be appropriate to deport someone who committed murder. And she had this very uncomfortably long pause because she was trying to think, oh my God, I can't say yes because I'm a liberal. She did end up saying that, <laughs> and it's an interesting point. She says, you know what? We should not have to do the job of the feds, that this should be up to us and the federal government shouldn't. So what's the conservative response to that? So uh, there is one legislator, House and Senate, that sponsored legislation that said no sanctuary for criminals. That's me. On the very first day in December, that we could sponsor a bill, and I and I was prompted to do it early because in my district there was a young man that was hacked to death with a machete, and he was illegal. His parents are illegal. His illegal parents said, if uh, uh, Dow Constantine communicated with ICE, my child would still be alive because the primary victims of these crazy criminals are other illegal immigrants, okay? Now, so the bill basically, what I tried to do is try to make it a little more focused, and I said, we're not gonna focus on people that are here illegally that are not committing crimes. Federal government's gonna have to figure out what to do with them. We're not gonna figure out, we're not gonna look at people that are witness a crime, victim of a crime, or report a crime, because they are actually eligible for a victim visa. Okay, we are gonna focus on people that are already incarcerated, they're already criminals, they need to be deported. 
And uh, I was on Como Town Hall with this immigration lawyer, and it was really good because he, had a, he hurt his eye and he had an eye patch and he put sunglasses on. I go, hey, Luis, man, you look like a total gangster, right? <laughs> so, but he kept trying to make the issue bigger about we need to reform criminal justice. No, we don't need to reform criminal justice. These people are already criminals. They, aren't, they need to be deported. Well, we need to reform immigration. Okay, you know, we could talk about reforming immigration. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that are already criminals, they're already incarcerated, they need to be deported. Now, 80% of the illegals that are currently incarcerated are there for uh, drunk driving and spousal abuse. And when I talk to some other advocates for the uh, immigration, they start talking, well, you know, culturally, they go to men in, when they're in Mexico, they beat their wife, and then they come here and they beat their wives. And I go, so you're telling me that that's acceptable? It's not acceptable. They're criminals. They need to be deported. Now, the other 20% are really bad people. And, and the intro, I wrote a letter to Dow Constantine, and I said, Dow Constantine, you're not even helping these criminals. You're making them take a five-hour bus trip over the uh, Snoqualmie Pass to get to Yakima instead of a one-hour plane ride because you're not letting King County Airport uh, 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 refuel ice planes. So, I mean, that's how crazy this is. But the interesting thing was I had 100% support from my Hispanic friends, right? Some, uh, I had a couple of guys come up to me when I was in Lowe's, like a couple of days later. Hey, you Senator Fortunato? I go, yeah. Hey, we saw you on Como News 4. We agree with you 100%, right? And somebody goes, well, I, I said, these three Mexicans came up. And they go, what? how did you know they were Mexicans? Well, they came up to me and go, you Senator Fortunato? We're Mexicans. <laughs> I go, that's, I said, that's how I knew. You know, so these people, they know they are primary victims are other elite, so they're not even helping the community that they pretend to accept. Now, I sent out this thing to other senators and I said, I, I like your support in this bill. It focuses on criminal illegal aliens. And the response I got back from the other side was, you're using dehumanizing terms like alien. <laughs> I said, well, it is a term used by the federal government to devise immigration status. You're a citizen or you're an alien. Oh, they're undocumented immigrants. They're not immigrants. My parents are immigrants. They came through Ellis Island. These people jumped the fence. They're not immigrants. I go, they're undocumented. If you're undocumented, let's go to the federal government. You are illegal. So you're an illegal alien. And if you're a criminal, you're a criminal illegal alien, and you need to be deported. And that's who we're focusing on. Chief Culp, I, I heard during this conversation that the law is the law. And if you're in this country illegally, you should be deported. Is the law the law when it comes to the sanctuary status of the city of Republic as it relates to gun rights? Is the law the law? Yeah, we passed a, a anti-gun law that you decided to say, hey, you know what, we're gonna be a sanctuary on gun rights, which of course, for people who love gun rights, that's amazing. But the law says otherwise. Yeah, I, last time I checked the Constitution, it doesn't say anything about it coming to this country legally was a constitutional right. And just to be clear, I'm 100% in support of legal immigration. And I want to clear one thing up as well. Um, your local police, when they pull someone over for a speeding ticket or um, any crime, actually, that they're investigating, when they go to talk to a witness or they talk to a suspect, they don't ask what that person's immigration status is. They just investigate the crime or they write the ticket that's not a local law enforcement um, issue. That's a federal issue. So I know that that was one of the reasons why they wanted to be, uh, us to be sanctuary state. We were told, well, witnesses won't feel free to come and, and report crimes. Well, your local police never ask people their immigration status. That does not happen anywhere. So I'm definitely for the federal government enforcing our immigration laws, and, and that's our job. Tim Eidman, let's talk about K through 12 sex ed for, uh, really we've been talking about this for kindergartners through third grade. State did its own survey, overwhelmingly folks from all across the state. And by the way, lots of folks in King County overwhelmingly said we don't like the idea of sex ed for K through third grade. How much of this do you think should be left up to the individual districts, the school districts? 
Well, uh, clearly, yes. Uh, it, it was an amazing turnout of citizen participation down in Olympia. I mean, it was very, very impressive. I mean, it was like literally nearly 800 people took the time to go down there. And the thing that's frustrating about Olympia is it's really hard to do that because we all like work for a living. So it's harder for us than the left, I think, uh, that to, be <laughs> <laughs> to make time for that. But when you have this overwhelming rejection of the idea and yet they just pass it out of committee by one vote, it's at that point you really need a new governor. And it's really crazy land down there right now. Sabino? I mean, it's, it's kindergartners being taught this stuff. I just think it is so crazy because there is no pushback. There's no opposite ideas going in the opposite direction. It's all Seattle-centric and Jay Inslee's perfectly happy signing any of this stuff. So again, everybody on this stage, we're not the problem. Jay Inslee's the problem. And, and I've, I want to really make this point important. If you have picked a horse in this race, good for you. I'm not going to ask you to change. But in August, the voters are going to decide who they want to take on Jay Inslee and who's really going to challenge him and get in his face. Whoever that person is, let's all rally around that individual. And I think that's really important. So. Something, Anton Sokrov, that is related to this, and it's an issue that it's been percolating. It was bigger a couple years ago, transgender student rights in a, on a campus. You have a student who is transgender. Where do you stand as far as bathroom and locker room access? Because that issue has not gone away, and it's not going to. And I agree. Um, I think our moral compass has shifted, and it's a really wrong place right now as a state in the country. Uh, I, I, you know, and I, I, we hear about the initiative, you know, that's going through the sex ed, and it's, you know, again, with three boys, myself, it's unbelievable. But the solution is not to have your kids go back to your home school. I heard a lot about it from folks that are frustrated that will, that's basically said they will take kids back to home and, and they'll teach them at home. That's not going to solve the problem. That's just going to create the bigger snowball later down the road. Uh, we need to fight back uh, and we have to be very loud. I, I've been a supporter of school choice from day one. I support school choice. I believe that's the best solution that we can have where the parents can decide which schools they can actually send their kids to. And by implementing school choice, although it's not easy in Washington State, will give us that opportunity to actually decide for your kids, you know, which school, which program to have, uh, and things like that. At the end of the day, I, you know, the things with transgender, I think we're, we're focused so much on these very small cases that we're forgetting about the 98% here. The 98% where the girls used to compete between each other and now are forced to compete with somebody who and There's a lawsuit compete. on that in Connecticut. Right. So, but but for, from a legal perspective, obviously there are anti-discrimination laws. So it, it, how would you then, as a governor, as the person who gets to talk to this, what's the goal then in accommodating a transgender student in a public high school? Um, I think it, you know, from, from the educational point of view, every single child should receive education. That, that's the whole point of the school. Right uh, now, it, I don't want to focus on which specific area where discrimination is occurring because this is a gray area, right? Because a lot of times discrimination is used as an, as an excuse for something else. So I, at the end of the day, I want to make sure that every single child gets the education they deserve, no matter what what they represent, right? But again, school choice would be a one solution because I do support schools that are through. Uh, churches, Christian schools, they should have the same ability than any other school, uh, and parents can decide which school to send it to. Joshua Freed, is it a gray area? Is which a gray area? Accommodation for transgender students. Oh, no, I think we need uh, locker rooms for boys and locker rooms for girls, and when appropriate, we can build unisex bathrooms. If somebody wants to have a, their own private place to be able to change and they feel uncomfortable in either place, I don't know why we couldn't Where have a you unisex. I think it's fine to, if somebody wants a place for them to go individually, they have the ability to do so. Some kids, even 
guys or gals that identify as a guy and they identify as a girl, just sometimes they feel uncomfortable in large groups changing the locker room, let them go into their unisex bathroom as well. It's a private place for that they can use it. I think that's easy enough. I'm in construction, been doing that for 15 years. I could build you a bathroom in a couple days. So I think we take care of this situation quite quickly. But when it comes to comprehensive sexual education and the sexualizing of our kids at such a young age, this curriculum, if you had a chance to look at it, uses this graphic detail and they're encouraging kids to explore their sexuality at five years old. Can we just let kids be kids? Can we let, can we let the, yeah. Can we let the parents talk to their own children about the birds and the bees or about their own sexuality when they get to appropriate age? I know my wife and I took the opportunity uh, to talk to each one of our five kids, so they heard it from us. I don't want to leave it to an educator that I don't know that gets to share their own perspective of sexuality. That's my responsibility. We need to get back to reading, writing, and arithmetic, because I'm telling you, we're at a point today where one of my daughters was at University of Washington Bothell sitting in a class, and the professor told her we need to start calling the trees by their proper pronouns. This is sadly not even a joke. She came home and said, I'm out. So we've now enrolled her in an online school out of California. What's the pronoun? Well, I think if it has nuts or no nuts, see, that's how you determine. <laughs> Senator Phil Fortunato. That's literally the only thing I can think of. Right? Senator Fortunato, how much of this can be dealt with with school choice? Yeah. Well, some of that, yeah. I, I mean, part of my problem is we are passing state laws based on LGBTQ issues. Uh, senator Randall stood up and said, I am the first queer senator. So what does that mean? I, I don't know what that means. And, and so far, nobody has actually been able to explain that to me. And I go, we are passing laws on transgender people. Now, what does that mean? What is the definition? Is it a transvestite, somebody that tends to dress like the opposite sex? Is that what it is? Is it a mental issue? Is it a, philo a philosophical issue or psychological issue? What is it? And so that we can identify what actually is a transgender person. And so far, in the legislature, I have not gotten an answer. So how in the world can we write state law based on transgender issues Well, we cannot even define what a transgender person is? And so in some cases, it's somebody who identifies as somebody from the opposite sex. So it's a psychological thing. Well, no, it's not really psychological, it's physical. Well, is it physical? I mean, of course, there is the chromosomal issue. You do have some of those issues. But it's, you know, it's important that we use the correct terms and that we identify these, uh, uh, these things so that we can actually address the problem. You know, Joshua talks about having a separate, uh, a separate room, separate facility. Well, I mean, that, that is a, an option. That is something in a public school system that would help solve the problem. I certainly don't want my daughter going in with somebody that I, some boy that identifies as a boy. I mean, the whole transgender bathroom issue, uh, the police, for example, constantly go in with, with women report a man in the, in the ladies' room. I don't know why women aren't in the men's room, but apparently it's just lady, it's men in the women's room, and, and they can't do anything about it until the guy actually does that, something. And in most cases, they do wind up doing something, right? They're there for illicit purposes, but they're just using that as an excuse, but they can't do anything about it. So, so can I, a quick question on that point, because so let, let's back up the most of the time that happens, only because, you know, I talk about the news all the time. It's literally my like, job. And we don't hear these, I hear concerns, and I think that they're completely valid, but I don't hear the actual cases that are happening as often as you're saying. Oh, I'm not saying they happen very often. I'm just saying that when you have a situation where you have a man staying, uh, I mean, if a man goes into a lady's room, does whatever it is, his business, and leaves, that's one thing, okay? But when a man goes into a lady's room and stays there, that's different. And, and, and sometimes women come out, and they, uh, friends of mine are King County police officers, and they constantly say to me, 
We constantly get these reports where women are, are saying there's a man gawking at us in the ladies' room. Okay, that's the issue. Because that guy typically is not a transgender person. It's just kind of pervert using it as, a, as an excuse. So how do you address that issue? Because all he has to do is say, I'm transgender. Well, what are you doing in the bathroom for 25 minutes? You know, and it's, it's those kinds of things that, that cloud the issue, that they're using it as an excuse. And, and that, I think, is uh, once again a threat to public safety. So, so not the guy that goes in, that goes in, does his little thing and leaves, not the issue. You know, many times, people don't even know that, okay? It's, it's the guy that's going in there, he's going in there for a reason, and he's using it as an excuse. And therein lies the problem where we say most. Chief Lauren Culp, is it a sort of a cloudy issue or is it cut and dry? Um, I think it's pretty much cut and dry. I mean, how far do we go? You know, I mean, I think everyone should be treated equally, um, but no one specially, right? And so, I mean, that's the American way, right? And I think if you have a penis, you go into the men's. If you have a vagina, you go into the women's. I mean, otherwise, you're opening up a whole can of worms, like Phil was saying. It, it's about public safety as well. You know, it, people use it as an excuse all the time to go in and gawk at women in bathrooms. So we, we've got 13 minutes left. So I'm going to ask you, and I've got to get to this next section. I, my notes are titled Baggage. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll try to keep this quick. So the, two polls recently came out. One was an Elway poll, came just uh, last month. None of you are over 7%. Inslee at 46% support. To be fair, 34% are undecided. Survey USA has Tim Iman at 11%, but no one else over 5%. So what, what can you tell folks in this audience, Joshua Freed, that you have a shot at, at taking on Jay Inslee? Well, yeah, we have to spend money. So we have not gone to the airwaves yet in our campaign. I've been traveling around all four corners of our beautiful state to Wenatchee, Spokane, Yakima, Ponderé, Asoden, and there's no place too distant for me to go because we need to make sure that we're listening to the voters. And so we're going to be starting to go to the airwaves very soon. That means going on radio ads, TV ads. I have a station recommendation for you. Yes, I bet you do. <laughs> And I believe our consultant's already reaching out to your, uh, your sales force to making sure that we'll have those ads playing, 775, I can't say the others, but you know, there's some great radio there's stations. No there are no others. Great stations across our state. So what we need to look at is nothing changes unless we have a new governor. And so as we look at the failures of our current governor that are evidenced all around us as I travel the state, you can see them, you can experience it quite clearly. People are suffering under state. Crime is at a higher rate than it's ever been before. And I'm presenting common solutions, meaning pulling people to the table. King Pierce and Snohomish County, their biggest, most important concern is unaddressed mental health issues and the rise of crime. The second biggest issue to them is saying they're feeling out of control with the spending and taxation that's coming out of Olympia. The second poll does, was done across the state showing the same results, yet education and transportation was way down here. These are winning issues for Republicans. We are ones who can speak to making sure that we can restore proper order in the state of Washington. We can restore safety and civility that people so desperately need. I can reach across um, aisles. I can make sure that we have a big tent. It's not just Republicans. We have the ideas, and we need to reach out to the independents and the libertarians, and <laughs> Mr. Welty, thank you for coming here. We need to pull people into the big tent and making sure that we win. If we're just isolationist, we're gonna have another 35 years. And the things that we're talking about tonight and how far we're going with comprehensive sex education, with taking away gun rights, with over taxation, this is a unique window that we've been waiting for for 35 years. If we miss this window, it may be another 35 years. So my hope and support is if you have already made your decision tonight, and if it's not me, that you reconsider. Because I believe that the most experienced, most prepared candidate to go up against Jay Inslee in November. So thank you. Anton Sakharov, is Joshua Freed the most prepared candidate to go up against Jay Inslee? Well, my view is very simple. I'm the only candidate on this stage that doesn't have the baggage. And I have answered every single question online. It's up for public to view. I have 400 question answers on my Facebook. 
and I have answered every single one of them. And you can go today, tonight, tomorrow, and ask another one, and it is out in the public. Now, back, to, and please do, because I, I love questions. Please do. But again, at the end of the day, I don't believe the name recognition is the most important thing. Ainsley has the best name recognition. He's not going to win. No? no? So that's not going to help. But at the end of the day, please do the research, because a lot of candidates on our stage, there might be great Republicans, but do have the baggage. And that's the truth. Senator Phil Fortunato, do you have baggage? Uh, well, 35 years ago, I parked on the wrong side of the street. Um, so they were the, uh, you know, the Democrats were hitting me up with a bunch of ads at one time, and, I, and just one right after another, and they were just stupid, idiotic things. And so I took a picture of a no parking sign, and I said, 35 years ago, Senator Fortunato parked here, right? And, and the funny thing, so I put that out, and the funny thing was, I was doorbelling on the very last day before the election, and it's raining. I park on the wrong side of the street. I then go and doorbell three houses. I walk back to my car, and there's a no parking sign. <laughs> so, but there's only one person here that actually has legislative experience. There's only one person here that has actually drafted legislation and knows how to actually implement these things legislatively in order to make it happen. You know, the governor can do the, has the veto pen, but the governor also has governor request bills. Hey, I want my bill done. Don't expect me to veto, don't expect me to approve any bill that you send to me if I don't get my agenda passed. Here's my governor's request bills. No sanctuary state, this, that, transportation funding. Somebody said to me, what's the first thing you're gonna do if you're elected governor? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sign my oath of office and fire the Secretary of Transportation. I go. So Secretary of, Secretary of Transportation goes to a national conference, and at this conference he says, we can't do anything with, about congestion. We just have to live with it. So I respond with a letter, a nice four-page letter, and I basically say, your agency, one of the things that your agency has to do is relieve congestion. Now, if you can't do it, get the hell out of the way and let somebody else who can. I go, what happened? What would happen if, uh, if uh, when uh, John Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon at the end of the decade, and the guy he hires says, nah, can't do that. How long do you think that guy would have his job? So I'm the only one here with legislative experience. I know how to get the things done. My wife says to me, do you know what the governor does? I go, yeah, I know what he does. Doesn't do anything. So why I want to run for no. governor. No. Tim Iman. Thurston County judge last week said that you concealed over $766,000 in contributions in violation of campaign finance laws. Uh, regardless of how people feel about whether or not you are getting targeted, and you certainly made a very compelling case that you're getting targeted by Bob Ferguson. However, it is something that you're dealing with. It's one of a few things you're dealing with, bankruptcy as well, the stolen chair situation. So I can imagine... Oh, the chair, the chair. I can imagine some of the attack ads against you. So what exactly is the plan to overcome that? I think it's really important that for... There's a reason people know my name. is because they've seen me fight for them for 20 years. And the track record is very clear. 11 statewide campaigns all passed these tax initiatives that have saved the taxpayers $43 billion. The reason they know my name is not just because they know my name, it's because they've seen me fighting for them every step of the way. But it's not like they didn't just leave me alone. Last year alone, they spent $5 million bringing up the chair, bringing up all this campaign finance stuff. And what we learned was voters are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. They know what's important and they know what's not important. And what they found was that they wanted somebody that was fighting for them. And at no point did I back down. I leaned into it. I showed up at every event, let them beat the crap out of me. And at the end of the day, the voters ended up voting for that measure. I was able to deliver under the most intense pressure. There is no pressure that's even close to that running for governor. I know it's going to be 20, 25, 30 million. But Rick right there 
told me earlier that he's saved $9,000 over the last 20 years from lower car tabs. I've delivered for voters over and over again, and I think that buys you a lot of goodwill. I think that buys you a lot of benefit of the doubt. And at the end of the day, the voters are going to choose between four more years of Jay Inslee, a guy who's raised your taxes $50 billion, versus somebody who's fought for you for 20 years and lowered them 43. I'll take that fight all day long. So... So real quickly, because this is actually kind of interesting, because I think the narrative on th this Survey USA data can be a positive or a negative, depending on your perspective, right? So you're favorable, 21%, negative 25%. So this is about the same, let's say. Neutral is 32%. You've been fighting for folks for 20 years. Why is that positive not a little bit higher? Why are there so many neutrals? Uh, my negatives are much higher than that. Let me make that very clear, you know. There is going to be 45% of the people ain't going to like anybody on this stage. That is just the reality. I believe that the model we're following is the $30 tabs campaign, where we had lost in Seattle big. 74% of the people in Seattle don't want lower taxes. Good for them. Everybody else in the state felt overwhelmingly in favor of it. That's the model of a winning campaign. We are, Nobody on this stage is going to get a blowout, but I fundamentally believe, and I really do, that at the end of the day, when they dump $25 million beating the crap out of any one of these people, eventually their negatives are going to go up to the same level mine is. But I've been through the crucible over and over, and I keep delivering, and the reason I'm delivering is because the voters have seen me produce results for them, and they know what's important, and they know what's not. Lauren Culp, do you think you're able to take on the 40% the that's going to hate you no matter what you say and the amount of money that's going to be thrown into this campaign? Right. I'm not uh, too worried about people hating me. I don't know if you know what I do for a living, but... <laughs> <laughs> I've read the book. Criminals... Oh, nice. Criminals do not like me. Um, no, my campaign is resonating with people all across this state. Um, Democrats, independents... Uh, and definitely conservatives. I'm, I'm hearing from them all the time, like I said earlier. Um, and it's because my campaign is based on solutions. You know, we all know what the problems are. Um, the middle of the road Democrats, um, they know what the problems are as well. They don't like their rights being taken away. They don't like to be taxed to death. They don't like what's going on in the cities with these homeless crises, all the crap on the sidewalks and people living everywhere. And they want solutions, and that's what I've been traveling this state um, constantly. And I've got a campaign set up with uh, volunteers all across this state uh, in every corner, and they are helping me to get the word out. And despite the fact that I'm still working as a chief of police, despite the fact that I'm being outspent by almost three to one, um, we have the most individual donors of any candidate on this stage. Thank you. And it's because of my message, uh, a solutions-based message. And we are going to do this, and I'm not at all intimidated about going up against Jay Inslee. So that hopefully answers your question. Does everyone, does everyone on this stage pledge to support whomever the nominee is on this stage? Everyone's a yes? Yes. Yes. Anton? Yes. Josh? Absolutely. Okay, I want to ask one final question. It's an annoying one. <laughs> and I hate it, which is why I love it so much. If you're not the nominee, Joshua Freed, who would you back on this stage? <laughs> That's a funny question, and one that I won't answer. <laughs> Does anyone so, want so, to answer so that here's my, <laughs> here's my reality. I'm running against Jay Inslee and his failed leadership. We've experienced it for eight years. He's running for his third term. He doesn't deserve his third term. He just got back running for president for five months, of which he allocated $2 million of our tax dollars to use for his aspirational dreams. He got an asterisk of support, came home, and decided he was going to run for a third term. 
term. And when asked, are you going to pay back those taxpayers, he said no. Then when asked the second question, are you going to take an appointment in D.C. if a Democrat wins the presidency, he said yes. He does not want the job here. My focus is on Jay Inslee. He's my opponent. I'm going to take him down in November. I recently met with the Republican Governors Association. They feel that my experience, my campaign, will perfectly match up against Jay Inslee in November. They see him as vulnerable, and they're investing in this state to make sure that we defeat him. I'll try so we'll to even forward. this out. 30 seconds left uh, per candidate. Make your final case, Senator. Are you going to ask the rest of them who they're going to vote for? I don't for? think. I oh, think yeah, you I'm set it up so no one's going to answer the question. <laughs> So I'm not going to answer that question either. So, so anyway, uh, I seconds. do want to say this. One of the things people say, well, how come we haven't heard more from your campaign? You have to remember, I'm the only elected official here. I have not been able to ask for money since December 13th. Now, however, in March 13th, you can be damn sure I'm going to be asking every one of you for money. So I can't ask for money. I can't do anything, basically. I can't really go out there. I can campaign a little bit, but we can't ask for money or solicit funds during the legislative session, which is why we have been saving all our money, waiting for March 13th. Now, I can't ask you for money, but I also can't stop you from mailing me checks. Anton Sakharov, 30 seconds. Well, I think Jay Inslee is completely beatable, but we have to get up the people. They have to get up the couch and be excited about the next governor. They have to come to the caucuses and starting tomorrow, be active. That's the only way to beat the democratic machine that we do have in our state. Uh, but again, I have the highest social media presence out there. I'm very loud on social media, as you, many of you know, and I'm very reachable. Anybody can direct message me on Twitter, Facebook, or, or actually pick up and phone, call me, and I'll pick it up. Uh, and I really hope that I represent the true, real Washington, and that's what I hope to do in this November. Chief Lauren Culp. I'm a lifelong resident of Washington State. I was born in Everett. Um, I moved to Republic when I was in high school. My parents moved our family over there. I grew up around Chimicum, which is by Port Townsend. And I ran my small business for over 20 years in the Olympia area. I did jobs all around Puget Sound. I went to the home shows in Seattle and the home show in Tacoma, advertising the work that I did for over 20 years. I've only been a police officer for 10. I realized my childhood dream at the age of 49 and became a police officer. <laughs> I have de narcotics detective uh, experience. I know what's going on with this so-called homeless crisis and I know how to fix it. I'm solution-based. I don't wanna just talk about the problems, I wanna talk about the solutions and I do that. And Sheriff David Clark, you may have seen him on Fox News a lot. He's the African-American with the cowboy hat. He, and March 7th, he's going to be at an event down in Grand Mound. Be sure to check my website, uh, cultforgovernor.com. Thank you all. Tim Iman. i got to stretch my legs. Um, <laughs> millions of dollars, millions of dollars would be needed for anybody to have a shot at actually moving up and taking on Jay Inslee. Literally, they spent $5 million last year educating everybody in the state of Washington. This was Tim Iman's $30 tabs initiative. I have that built-in level of support because I've been doing this for 20 years. I didn't take a year off, two years off, five years off. It has been every day, nonstop, advocating for taxpayers. And it is a rocky road out there. But I kept delivering. I would ask for your support. I believe that in August that the voters will ultimately, I hope, vote for me. And if you actually do support me, I will give you a run for governor against Jay Inslee that you will enjoy, that you're going to really cheer on. Because I think that our side is too nice. And we've done nice. We've done respectful. And I am going to be in his face every single day, not being nice, highlighting all these flaws. And Jay Inslee, I'm telling you, this guy is going to get rattled by somebody that's willing to take him on. I love Rob McKenna. I love Bill Bryant. But they were respectful of this guy. I will not be. Thank you. Thank you. So part of the, part of the way we get one of them up in the governor's mansion is making sure people know where they stand. So please, as we're airing this on Monday at three o'clock, make sure people know. KTTH.com will have the video up at about Monday or Tuesday. 
Um, thank you guys so much for participating. I hope you guys out there in the audience here in Tacoma and, of course, at home listening on the radio, I hope you got a lot out of this. Shout out to Affirm Clinic for Men for being our sponsor for this evening's debate. And we will see you out in the lobby so you can uh, meet the candidates and talk a little bit more. Thank you guys for coming out. Appreciate it.